I've always been an avid hiker, exploring trails across the country. But nothing could have prepared me for what I experienced in the dense woods of Alabama. It was a typical Saturday, and I decided to venture into a less traveled part of the state forest, seeking solitude and the peace of nature. As I meandered through the thick underbrush, the air was filled with the usual symphony of birds and rustling leaves. The trail was rugged, barely a path, really, winding through towering pines and overgrown shrubs. I had been walking for about two hours when I first sensed something off. The birds had gone silent. Even the wind seemed to hold its breath. I paused, listening, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And then I heard it. A low, guttural growl, unlike any animal I knew. My heart raced, I scanned my surroundings, seeing nothing. Assuming it might be a hidden predator, I picked up a sturdy stick, just in case. I moved cautiously, trying to make as little noise as possible. The growling continued, now accompanied by heavy, thudding footsteps. It sounded bipedal, which was odd. Bears don't usually walk on two legs, at least not for long. I quickened my pace hoping to distance myself from whatever was out there. And then, standing at the edge of a small clearing, I saw a creature like nothing I had ever seen before. It was tall, easily seven feet, covered in matted, dark fur. Its arms were long, dangling almost to its knees, and its hands had elongated fingers with what looked like claws. But it was the creature's face that truly horrified me. It had piercing yellow eyes and a snout-like nose, but its mouth? It was wide and full of sharp, jagged teeth. I froze, our eyes locked. The creature cocked its head, as if curious, and then let out a chilling howl. My survival instincts kicked in. I knew I couldn't outrun it, but maybe I could intimidate it. I raised my stick shouted as loudly as I could, trying to appear bigger, more threatening. To my relief, the creature backed away, but it didn't flee. It circled the clearing, watching me with those unnerving eyes. I began to back away slowly, not wanting to turn my back on it. As I retreated, the creature followed, maintaining its distance, but never taking its eyes off of me. After what felt like an actual eternity, I reached a more populated area of the forest. I glanced back one last time. The creature was gone, vanished as if it had never been there. I was pretty shaken up, but I made my way back to the car and drove home, trying to process what I had seen the whole way. The only thing I've ever come up with that came close to what I saw was a description of a cryptid known as the Alabama White Thang. Yes, Thang, T-H-A-N-G, a creature of local folklore that is said to inhabit the forests. Whether what I saw was this mythical being or something else, I'll never really know. But I don't think I'll be taking any hikes alone in those woods again. Not anytime soon. I wanted to share something wild that happened to my wife and me. We recently moved into this historic mansion, Sturdivant Hall in Alabama. Gorgeous place, but dude, it's got some seriously creepy vibes. The story goes that it's haunted by a bride who was left at the altar, and now her spirit can't find peace. So the first weird thing was the night we moved in. We're unpacking and we keep hearing these footsteps upstairs. 
I thought maybe it was just the house settling, you know, old house noises. But then my wife, she's super sensitive to this stuff, says, I think that we're not alone here. A few nights later, things got real. We're in bed and then suddenly the room goes cold, like really cold. And then we hear this soft sobbing. At first, I'm like, are you crying, babe? But she's just as freaked out as I am. We get up and there's nobody there. Just this feeling of sadness, like depression just hanging in the air. It didn't stop there. Doors would slam shut, lights flickered, and we'd find things moved around. But the craziest part? This old portrait in the main hall of a woman in a wedding dress. It's supposed to be the jilted bride. Well, some mornings we would find it turned to face the wall. No joke. We would put it right and the next day it's turned again. We did some digging into the history of the place. Apparently this bride was supposed to marry the owner's son, but he bailed on the wedding day. She was so heartbroken she never left the house, just withered away. And people say she's still waiting for her groom. One night, things hit peak spooky. We're asleep and I wake up to this figure at the foot of our bed. It's a woman in a wedding dress, but her face is all blurry. I'm about to scream, but then she just fades away. After that, we talk to a local historian. He said the only way to calm the spirit is to acknowledge her pain. So we held this little ceremony, just my wife and me, in the main hall. We basically said, we hear you and we're sorry for what happened to you and you can move on. And you know what? Things have been quieter since then. I mean, I still get the heebie-jeebies walking past that portrait, but at least no more ghostly visits in the night. So yeah, living in a historic mansion is not all just grandeur and beauty. You might get a ghostly roommate who's got some unfinished business. My experience in Cahaba, Alabama remains the most chilling and unexplainable encounter I've ever had. Cahaba, once a thriving state capital, now lies mostly in ruins, with stories of the paranormal woven into its very fabric. I was always fascinated by ghost tales and decided to visit this historic ghost town one autumn evening. As I walked through the abandoned streets, the sun setting behind the skeletal remains of old buildings, a profound silence enveloped the town. It was as though time had stopped, leaving behind only the echoes of the past. My destination was the old Cahaba prison site, notorious for its ghost sightings. The air grew colder as I approached the ruins. The prison, now just crumbled walls and overgrown with ivy, looked eerie in the twilight. I felt a weight in the air, heavy and unwelcoming. Ignoring the chill down my spine, I ventured closer. Suddenly, a soft whispering filled the air, like many voices speaking at once, but hushed, almost inaudible. I spun around, but there was no one. The whispering grew louder, turning into discernible words, yet in a language I couldn't understand. It felt as if the whispers were coming from the ground, the walls, the very air around me. And then I saw it, a faint glowing figure floating a few feet above the ground. It was a woman dressed in what looked like early 19th century clothing, her face sorrowful. She seemed to be searching for something or someone, her eyes meeting mine for a fleeting moment before she vanished into thin air. Stunned, I stood there trying to rationalize what I had just seen. That's when I heard the sound of chains dragging along the ground. The sound grew closer, and then, in the dim light, I saw another figure. This one was a man, his apparition more defined. He wore tattered prison garb, and chains were wrapped around his wrists and ankles. His eyes were hollow, filled with despair. He moved past me, not acknowledging my presence, and disappeared into the remains of a cell. 
The temperature dropped suddenly, and I felt a hand touch my shoulder. I spun around, but again, there was no one. Overwhelmed by fear, I decided it was time to leave. As I hurried back toward my car, the whispers followed me, growing fainter with each step I took away from the prison ruins. Once I reached my car, I looked back. The ruins were silent now, bathed in moonlight as if nothing had happened. I later learned that Cahaba is home to many ghost stories, rooted in its turbulent history. The prison was known for its harsh conditions and the suffering of its inmates, many of whom died within its walls. The woman I saw is said to be a lost soul, forever searching for her husband who died in the prison. That night in Cahaba opened my eyes to the world beyond our understanding. Whether these were spirits trapped in time or just some figments of local folklore, I can't say. But the encounter left me with a deep sense of the mysteries that history holds, some of which we may never really understand, at least not on this side. My encounter at the Slaws Furnaces in Birmingham, Alabama was an experience that haunts me to this day. Slaws Furnaces, now a defunct iron-producing blast furnace, is infamous for its paranormal activity and tragic history. As an enthusiast of industrial history and ghost stories, this seemed like the perfect place for an adventure. I arrived at the furnaces on a chilly October evening the skeletal remains of the old industrial complex stood against the fading light, their towering silhouettes casting long, ominous shadows. The air was tinged with the smell of rust and old metal, a lingering remainder of the site's past. As I wandered through the maze of pipes and furnaces, the atmosphere felt heavy with a sense of despair. The echo of my footsteps seemed to be the only sound until I reached the heart of the complex. That's when I first heard it, a distant, anguished scream. It was faint, almost lost in the wind, but unmistakably human. I paused, my heart pounding. The scream came again, closer this time, followed by the sound of metal clanging against metal. I thought of turning back, but curiosity propelled me forward. The sounds led me to what was once the main furnace area. There, amidst the towering structures, I saw a shadowy figure. It was a man, but his form was distorted, wavering as if made of smoke. He was shoveling coal into a furnace, his movements robotic and endless. His face, though indistinct, bore an expression of profound agony. As I watched, frozen in place, the air around me grew colder. The man stopped shoveling and turned to look at me. His eyes looked blank and sad. It was almost a palpable depression. I felt a chill run down my spine as we met eyes. Suddenly, the ground beneath me vibrated with the sound of the furnace roaring to life. The heat blasted outwards and the figure vanished into the flames. I stumbled back trying to comprehend what I had just seen. Later, I learned about one of Slaw's furnace's most famous ghosts, a foreman known as Schlage. He was notorious for his brutal treatment of workers, many of whom lost their lives due to unsafe working conditions. It's said that he met his own demise in one of the furnaces, and his spirit is believed to haunt the site. As I left the furnaces, the sounds of the past were still in my head. I couldn't help but feel this profound sense of sorrow for everybody who suffered there. The encounter there was more than just a ghost sighting. It reminded me of some of the really harsh realities of industrial labor, especially in the past, but even now, and the human lives that were so carelessly lost in the pursuit of progress and profit. I've never been one to believe in the paranormal, 
But what I experienced in an abandoned factory in Alabama changed everything. I'm from a small town where the most exciting thing is the annual county fair. So when my friend suggested exploring an old, supposedly haunted factory on the outskirts of town, I shrugged it off as just another adventure. It was a humid summer evening when we set out. The factory, once a bustling hub, now stood desolate, its skeletal structure looming against the twilight sky. We navigated through broken gates and overgrown weeds, our flashlights the only source of light. The inside was even eerier. Graffiti-covered walls, shattered glass, and the unnerving quiet. My friends, Jenna and Tyler, were ahead, their laughter echoing off the walls. I trailed behind, my curiosity mixed with a tinge of apprehension. As we delved deeper, the air grew colder, which was odd given that the Alabama heat was in full swing. We found an old office, papers strewn about as if the workers had left in a hurry. That's when I heard it, a faint whisper, almost like a sigh. I spun around, but there was nothing. Jenna and Tyler were in the next room, oblivious. I convinced myself it was just the wind, but as we moved to what looked like an assembly line, the atmosphere shifted. It felt like we weren't alone. I kept seeing shadows flit in the corners of my eyes. Every time I looked directly, there was nothing. Jenna, usually the brave one, suddenly grabbed my arm. Did you see that? She hissed. Tyler laughed it off, but I saw the fear in Jenna's eyes. We decided to explore the basement, which in hindsight was a terrible idea. The basement was pitch black, the air thick with the musty smell of decay. We hadn't taken more than 10 steps when a sudden chill enveloped us. Our flashlights flickered, and for a split second, I saw it. A dark figure standing at the far end of the room, its edges blurred as if made of smoke. Panic set in. We turned to run, but the figure was faster. It was everywhere and nowhere, a fleeting shadow that sent shivers down my spine. We stumbled our way back upstairs, tripping over debris in our haste. Once outside, we didn't stop running until we reached the car. We drove in silence, each lost in our thoughts. I kept glancing at the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that shadowy figure sitting in the back seat. I didn't sleep that night. Every sound seemed magnified, every shadow a reminder of that dark figure in the basement. The experience at the factory was just the beginning, the first of many encounters that would challenge my skepticism about the paranormal. That night in Alabama, in that abandoned factory, was where it all started. The night I came face to face with something I can't explain. My encounter in the dense forests of Oak Mountain State Park in Alabama remains one of the most spine-chilling experiences of my life. Known for its natural beauty, the park also harbors tales of the supernatural, particularly the legend of the woods. It was a cool, foggy evening when I set out for a hike through the more secluded part of the park. The fog was so thick it seemed to swallow the sounds of the forest, creating an eerie silence. As I walked, the only noise was the crunch of leaves under my boots. I had been walking for about an hour when I first heard it, a soft whisper barely audible over the rustle of the trees. I stopped, listening intently. The whisper grew louder, clearer, as if somebody was speaking directly into my ear, yet the words were indistinct, muffled. Feeling a mix of curiosity and apprehension, I followed the sound. It seemed to be leading me deeper into the woods, away from the marked trails. The farther I went, the more voices joined in, creating a chorus of whispers that surrounded me. It was disorienting. The voices seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. Then, in a small clearing shrouded in mist, I saw them. Figures, ethereal and translucent, 
drifting between the trees. They moved gracefully, their forms flickering like candle flames. I realized these were the sources of the whispers. Their faces were sorrowful, their eyes empty. One of the figures, a woman, moved closer to me. Her mouth moved as if speaking, but no sound came out. I reached out my hand, and as I did, a cold wind swept through the clearing, causing the figures to vanish, taking the whispers with them. Stunned and unnerved, I quickly made my way back to the main trail. The farther I got from the clearing, the more the normal sounds of the forest returned. Birds chirped, and the wind rustled the leaves, dispelling the oppressive silence of the woods. Back at the park entrance, I spoke to a ranger about my experience who didn't seem at all surprised. He told me that it was a hot spot for paranormal activity. Either way, I haven't been back to that part of the park since, and I don't intend to return. You know how people say, be careful what you wish for? Well, I've got a story that pretty much nails that. I used to live in this tiny studio apartment in San Francisco. It was one of those old Victorian houses turned into several units. Cool place, but really cramped. So one night, I'm lying in bed, scrolling through my phone, and I jokingly say out loud, man, I could use some more space in here. I laughed it off, turn off the lights, and go to sleep. And that's when things start getting weird. The next morning, I wake up and notice that my coffee mug isn't where I left it. It's on the other side of the kitchen counter. Odd, but I thought maybe I moved it and forgot. But then it starts happening more often. Stuff moved, lights turned on or off. My TV changing channels on its own. At first, I think maybe I'm just forgetful or it's some electrical issue. But then, one evening, things escalate. I'm sitting on my couch, and I hear this noise coming from the bathroom, almost like somebody rummaging through things. I freeze. I live alone, and there's no way someone else should be in my apartment. I muster up the courage, grab a frying pan, because, you know, that's going to help and slowly walk toward the bathroom. I flick on the light and nothing. The room is empty, but my toiletries are scattered all over the counter. My heart is racing and I'm trying to make sense of it all. I start thinking maybe my apartment is haunted. Sounds crazy, but what else could it be? It keeps happening. These little disturbances, like someone else is living with me, unseen. I try talking to it, asking it to leave me alone. I even try ignoring it, but nothing works. One night, I'm at a bar with a few friends and I tell them about my unseen roommate. One of them, who's really into this paranormal stuff, gets super excited and says we should do a seance in my apartment. I'm half drunk, so I think, why not? Maybe it'll be fun, or at least give me a good story. We set it up, candles and all, and started asking questions. At first, it's all jokes and laughs, but then the air shifts. It gets colder, and there's this pressure in the room. We ask if there's someone with us, and one of the candles goes out. Just like that. We all kind of freaked out, and we ended the seance, and my friends left me pretty quickly after that. That night, I barely slept. I kept hearing whispers, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. The next morning, I decided enough is enough. I started looking for a new place to live. A few weeks later, I moved out. The last night in the apartment was the weirdest. I'm packing the last of my stuff, and I hear a clear, distinct sigh, almost like somebody was relieved. I didn't stick around to figure out what it meant. I now live in a much newer building. No character, no charm, but also no unseen roommates. And I have more space. I don't know what was in that old apartment, and honestly, I don't want to know. But 
I guess be careful what you joke about in an old Victorian house. You might get more than you bargained for. Legends Never Die by Mariana O. Living in Los Angeles, you get used to the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. But there's a darker side to this city of stars, a side that I came face to face with one unforgettable night. It's the legend of the haunted Hollywood sign, a story that has intrigued and terrified locals and tourists alike. The ghost said to haunt this iconic landmark is believed to be that of Peg Entwistle, a young actress who tragically took her own life by jumping off the letter H in 1932. My encounter happened on a foggy night in November. I was an aspiring filmmaker at the time, fascinated by the history of Hollywood, and that night I decided to hike up to the Hollywood sign. I had heard the stories of Peg's ghost seen as a melancholic figure wandering near the sign, her presence often marked by the scent of gardenias, her favorite perfume. The hike was eerie but peaceful. The fog grew thicker around the base of the sign as I approached it. The letters were barely visible. I set up my camera anyway, hoping to capture some of the night's eerie beauty. That's when I smelled it a strong scent of gardenias in the air. It was strange because gardenias weren't common in that area. A chill went down my spine, but I brushed it off as nerves. I continued setting up my equipment, but then I heard something, a soft, sorrowful sobbing coming from the direction of the sign. Heart pounding, I turned toward the sound. Through the mist, I saw a figure near the letter H it was a woman, dressed in 1930s attire, her blonde hair and pale dress barely visible in the moonlight. She seemed to be in distress, sobbing into her hands. Remembering the legend, I realized that this had to be the ghost of Peg Entwistle. I was frozen in place, torn between fear and fascination. I wanted to approach her, to speak to her, but before I could move, she looked up. Our eyes met, and in hers I saw an indescribable sadness. Then, as suddenly as she appeared, she vanished into the mist. The scent of gardenias lingered for a moment longer, before fading away as she had. I stood there, shaking, trying to process what I had just seen. The experience felt surreal, like a scene from one of the old Hollywood films Peg had longed to star in. I packed up my equipment and hurried back down the trail, glancing back at the sign, half expecting to see her again. But there was nothing, only the silent letters looming in the fog. Since that night, I've read more about Peg and Twistle and the tragic end she met. Some say her spirit remains because of her unfulfilled dreams and the heartbreak that only Hollywood can bring. Others believe she wanders the hills as a warning to those drawn to the city's lights, a reminder of the fine line between dream and illusion. I haven't returned to the Hollywood sign at night since then. The memory of that encounter, the sight of the ghostly figure in the mist and the scent of gardenias have stayed with me. In the city of stars, where dreams and reality blur, the legend of the haunted Hollywood sign is a reminder of the ghosts that linger in the shadows of glamour and fame. The Curse of Turnbull Canyon by Julian L. The story I'm about to share took place in Turnbull Canyon, situated in the Puente Hills between Whittier and City of Industry, California. This area is notorious among locals for its dark history and eerie atmosphere. Before this experience, I was pretty much a skeptic, but what I experienced in Turnbull 
changed my perspective on the paranormal forever. It was a typical summer evening when my friend Alex and I decided to explore the canyon. We had heard the legends, tales of cult activity, ghost sightings, and an ancient Native American curse. Being fans of the supernatural, we thought it would be an exciting adventure, even if nothing happened. We parked our car near the entrance as the sun began to set. The canyon was known for its scenic beauty, but as darkness fell, the atmosphere shifted. There was a palpable sense of unease in the air, as if the canyon itself was warning us to stay away. As we ventured deeper, the path became rugged and overgrown. The sounds of the city faded away, replaced by the unsettling quiet of the wilderness. We came across an old rusted sign that read Turnbull Canyon, the letters barely legible. That's when Alex stopped and pointed to something in the distance. Through the trees, we saw what looked like an old abandoned building. Its windows were broken and the walls were covered in graffiti. As we approached, a feeling of dread washed over me. This was reportedly the site of numerous unexplained disappearances and alleged cult rituals in the past. We dared each other to go inside. The air was colder as we stepped through the broken doorway. Inside, the remains of what might have been a chapel lay in ruins. Graffiti covered the walls with symbols that made no sense to us. That's when we heard it, a low whispering sound echoing through the empty halls. It seemed to come from all around us. I felt a chill run down my spine. Alex whispered that we should leave and I couldn't have agreed more. As we turned to do so though, a sudden gust of wind slammed the door shut, plunging us into utter darkness. We fumbled for our flashlights, hearts racing. The whispering grew louder, and then, in the beam of my flashlight, I saw them. Shadows moving across the walls, shapes that were distinctly human but distorted, twisting in ways that defied logic and biology. We ran, not looking back, the whispering and the sounds of something chasing us filling our ears. We didn't stop until we reached the car. Gasping for breath, we looked back at the canyon. It was quiet again, as if nothing had ever happened. After that night, we did some research, and we learned about the tragic history of Turnbull Canyon. From Native American massacres to tragic accidents and rumored occult activities of the bad sort. Some say the canyon is cursed, haunted by the spirits of those who lost their lives there. I can't explain what we saw and heard that night. Maybe it was power of suggestion, or maybe it was something else, something unexplainable. But one thing is for certain, Turnbull Canyon holds secrets, and it turned me into a believer. The Haunting of Bodie Ghost Town by Carla P. Growing up in California, I had always been fascinated by the state's rich history during the Gold Rush era. Bodie, a well-known ghost town from that period, was particularly intriguing to me. The town, once a bustling place filled with miners and their families, is now a state historic park, preserved in a state of arrested decay. I had heard stories of hauntings and paranormal occurrences in Bodhi, but I never truly believed them, until I experienced it myself. It was a crisp October morning when my friends and I decided to visit Bodhi. The drive was long, and the landscape barren, as we approached the isolated town. Upon arrival, the first thing that struck me was the eerie silence that hung over the place. The old buildings, some still furnished with items from the past, stood as silent witnesses to a bygone era. We roamed the town, visiting the old saloon, the schoolhouse, and the decaying homes. It felt like stepping back in time, each building telling its own story of the past. As the day wore on, 
the sky began to cloud over, casting a somber mood over Bodhi. It was in the old Methodist church where I first felt something was off. A cold draft swept through the building, despite the lack of wind outside. I shrugged it off as a quirk of the old structure, but then I heard a faint sound, like a whisper, coming from the back of the church. I turned around, but there was no one there. My friends were in a different part of the town, so I was alone. The whispering continued, a hushed, unintelligible murmur. I felt a chill down my spine and decided to leave the church. Later, we gathered in what used to be the main street. The sun was setting and the fading light gave Bodhi an even more ghostly appearance. That's when I saw something that made my blood run cold. Up in the window of one of the houses, there was a face staring down at us. It was the face of a woman, pale and sad. I blinked and she was gone. I mentioned it to my friends, but they laughed it off, saying that my imagination was getting the best of me. But I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. As we were leaving, I took one last look at the town. For a moment, I thought I saw figures standing in the shadows, watching us leave. They were there one second and gone the next. The drive back was quiet. I kept thinking about the face in the window and the whispers in the church. After doing some research, I learned about the legends of Bodhi, stories of spirits of the dead miners and their families who are said to still inhabit the town. Some locals believe that these spirits are protective of Bodhi and wary of visitors. My experience in Bodhi was unsettling, to say the least. I haven't been back there since, and although I'm not opposed to it, if I do go back, I'll be much more cautious this time. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields, basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield One, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes, and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost but he's an experienced hunter 
and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long but he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? Something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again, though, and I don't plan on ever going back. In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. In 2013, I worked as a baker in a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, 
but also curious. I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m., unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. And I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit. It was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle had managed to get on top of the tarp that I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my coworkers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and I told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other coworker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words. It had texture to it. I have never heard anything like it before. It was like somebody speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me. But after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, what was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We were both frozen in disbelief. At the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on the top of the espresso bar moving, and we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a little bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and then we ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, Okay, I get it. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I have ever witnessed. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, my grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes just to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery 
as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest, as she chuckled and then quipped, Wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her, without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite of the Methodist church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where a four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what seemed to be a woman of Asian heritage with a bob haircut, pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare they were giving us, it could be assumed that they had been staring for longer than we had noticed them. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in their eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds, but I could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on but no one's home look. It's one like a corpse might have before their eyes were closed. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate again with a corpse at the time. Their mouth slowly developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen, as their dead eyes looked at me and my grandma, unwavering. In this deafening silence, similar to a panic attack or a fight-or-flight feeling, my grandma and I turned back to each other chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen when I bring it up to her. If anyone can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've had any experience with something similar, let me know. I know that certain areas of the Tempe campus are haunted, I couldn't find any information on an incident like this, though. So, my partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally visit him. I live in Scotland, and he lives in Arizona. Experience number one. So I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we're both interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences. Whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment. But I saw, I heard, and I felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at about four in the morning, I was on the sofa playing on my phone, jet lag, you know, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to a shadow person phenomenon. It was just dark, humanoid shaped, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned almost as though it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind somebody who could also see it. It did a sort of double take and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I've come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me, watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and nobody was there, but I felt that negative presence over me, as though it was trying to work out who I was and why I was there. It was told in very clear terms that it was not welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine by me. Experience number two. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome, and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome and another to a recreation spot by a lake. 
I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land. Nothing felt bad, just a sort of curiosity, but one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix, after a day at a lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got the not alone feeling again, but still it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation, and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was a Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, and completely in white, clothes and hair and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him. He simply stood, watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling this story, other than the fact that I thought maybe a lighter story would be better to put with a spooky one at the beginning. In any case, I hope you enjoyed these stories, and if you've had any similar experiences in Arizona, let me know. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into, but let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother, and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers, scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom, and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. 
I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day two. Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. 
Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools. But when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably 10 screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station, 
We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end, goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization, and that civilization in reality was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough though, I heard music, more specifically a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone, the gloom, 
the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The wood seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it? Or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82, the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason, to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then, we realized we could see straight through the guy, to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear, as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at cabin C-82 is something we reminisce about often, but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia, and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in cabin C-82.